they had children, was the fuel of evolution. Now the fuel's gone, there's no more firewood. So we can't evolve in, the, in that sense, we simply can't. It's physically impossible. However, as I say, this is an instant in evolutionary time, and it's one particular set of cultures, so it may well start again. But, it's a, it's small. but again, you're talking about in Western industrialized countries, sure. survival is 96%, where in third world countries, infant survival is 50%. So uh, you can't say that, I think it's two different questions. Are humans evolving? Is natural selection mm. still operating? Natural selection is obviously still operating. Some people live, some people die, some people reproduce, some don't. And again, we have to turn to those countries with higher reproductive rates. And my guess is that natural selection is having its greatest effect on the Im immune system. And those with the best immune systems, not the best brains, are the ones who are going to mm. yeah. pass on genes. Stephen Pinkett. Why can you? Sorry, I'm, I, why, why should I pass on that? Can you just tell us <laughs> a bit more why you think that's the case? Well. Um, because disease is, is, is something that obviously wipes someone out before or maybe after reproductive age, rap, wipes out children, and in, in massive ways. Uh, plagues, um, we've all heard about the Ebola virus, HIV, and the death rate is huge in, in third world countries. Malaria, still a great killer in third world countries. And the recent evidence shows that these, these, these diseases are coming back stronger and more coming virulent. Back stronger. Tuberculosis TB is and coming back, cycle. cholera. And um, as I said, infant survival is 50%. And yes, this is the, the, these are the countries where the still the reproductive rate, even with infant death, 50%, are still increasing in population size, whereas in Western affluent countries, population You've written about the brain lots of me. Has the brain reached its optimum size? Is there no way that it is ever going to get bigger? What could make it bigger? What could make it say, look, I've got to have a bit more? Well, it's clear what's not going to make it bigger, and that's evolutionary inertia, which is alive in a lot of people's imagination. In science fiction, you often have a picture of what we're going to look like in 100,000 years. There are these bulbous-headed, bald, varicose-veined, spindly-bodied little homunculi. Uh, and that's the assumption, on the assumption that if you take all of the trends that have held for the last million years and extrapolate them, you'll see what our descendants look like. Now, that's not valid, and I think Steve makes a, a very important point in saying that what's going to determine, determine how we evolve is simply going to be birth and death rates. Uh, the brain is uh, evolved because it was a handy gadget. The question is, is it going to, is further development going to bring benefits that exceed the costs? Maybe not. As Steve pointed out, it hasn't changed, uh, as far as we can tell, in 30,000, perhaps 100,000 years. And indeed, the brain is a very costly organ. It's big. It bobs around at the end of this, this delicate little stalk. It's got to go through the pelvis of a woman during childbirth. It uses 20% of our nutrients, even though it takes up only 2% of our body mass. And so at least it's plausible that it's reached a, a kind of optimum of costs versus benefits, although we, we can't know for sure since we can't uh, see what's going to happen in the next 100,000 years. But death rate and birth rate may not be the only determinant of evolutionary success, but they may also be selective determinants of who is going to be allowed to have a birth rate. And one of the things that will happen in a culture of one sort rather than another are um, sexual advantages given to people who are mentally endowed in a certain way, which would favor them, in fact, having um, a chance to breed, given the fact that when they do breed, their offspring have a 96% chance of survival. The question is, who's going to have the biggest chance of having the 96% chance of survival? And that may be actually determined by cultural changes, which will make certain people into as it were, neuters, rather like at an ant's nest. Not because they are serving the others, but simply because they can't get mates because they're not interesting to the selecting females. Can I come to a stream? No, hang on, but I think this is... I, I, don't, I, 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 I mean, this is an, this is an issue, this, mm. and I think that it's... A, um, I mean, we tend to look at it as if it's a purely quantitative question of birth and death and the survival, but it may be a question of who is selected and allowed to breed, I mean, and that may have a very profound evolutionary sure. I mean, outcome. I mean, evolution is an examination with two papers, and I passed the first one. I am a lie, at least I think I hope I am, <laughs> but I failed the second one because I have no children. And that's always been the case, and it's much harder to mark the second paper because most of the male candidates have left by the time the results come through, and we tend to forget that. Uh, but again, if you look at differences in reproductive rate, um, in some societies, there were quite fantastic differences. The person I'm aware of with the most children of all, I think it's mentioned in your book, actually, is our friend Moulay Ismail the Cruel of Morocco. 
clearly not a very nice man, he had 888 children because he was able to monopolize the female, females in his court. And so for every one Moulay Ismail, there was plenty of Fred Smith's The Glum of Morocco who had no children at all. <laughs> and that too has gone away. The variation in reproductive success has dropped. Not just the variation in staying alive or dying, staying, uh, it's the variation in the number of children. So evolution really has slowing down or stopped in the West for now. Can I come back to something you said about cro magnon man sitting next to you on the uh, underground in Camden Town? I'm sure a lot of your neighbours will be around to have a chat with you tomorrow morning. <laughs> but can, uh, um, do you think that there's a sense in which uh, the evolution, uh, any evolution that's taken place since what people call the Stone Age, has brought about particular mental problems, has brought about particular mental stresses which are un unique to this, the part of time that we're in? Uh, there have been various claims of this kind. I'm not sure the evidence is that good. I mean, I'm not one of the... I mean, there, are, it, there has been a foolish tendency for people of vaguely pinko tone, amongst whom I count myself, to deny the fact that evolution could affect the brain. Well, that's just silly. There are there are 60,000 or so working genes in a human being, and half of them are switched on at any time in the brain. In the red blood cells, only 66 are. So clearly, there are many, many genetic changes in the brain which are open to natural selection. And we, I think most people who are in long-term mental hospitals are there for genetic reasons. They have inherited severe mental diseases. Beyond that, though, I'm not quite sure that I would be able to pinpoint anything where natural selection is working directly on single behavioural genes, but Stephen Pinker, I'm sure, sure would know much better than I do. Well, I would agree. Um, one could, though, make the, the argument that some forms of dysfunction are due to a mismatch between the environment that we live in now and the environment in which we evolved. So when you see figures that 30% <clears throat> of people are, uh, have dyslexia, that can't mean that 30% of people have some neurological disease, as it's sometimes claimed, but rather we evolved in an environment without written language. <clears throat> it's an evolutionary novelty, only maybe 5,000 years old in, in um, some parts of the world. And uh, one could say that the brain isn't adapted to written language in the same way that it's adapted to spoken language. And if there's a high percentage of people who don't master it very well, that's just a, a, a is a reflection of our evolutionary uh, heritage. There may be other syndromes that also can be analyzed in terms of this mismatch. Yes, well, this is behind the question I was asking, uh, Meredith Small, that the distance traveled, the amount of accomplishments that people have to have nowadays will increasingly have to have just to get through the day is a long way from uh, primates. But, but let's keep in mind that for almost all of us, we're riding on the backs of a few people who invent wonderful things. Most of us use computers, but we didn't invent them, and we don't know how they work. So. Not everyone has all the smarts. There are some people who have more than others uh, in terms of figuring out things like computers and cars and telephones and whatever. I suppose partly what I'm asking is, is there anything unique about the cluster of information and the uh, scramble for success that was going on? And we are told by economists and some biologists is becoming more and more extreme. Is there anything that is pressing on people's minds in what could be called a unique way and making things happen? to the humankind, which it wasn't forced to happen, weren't forced to happen before. I think our groupings are, are not the sort of groupings for which we were selected in the savannah. Um, very small groupings, very small bondings and, and alliances were required in order to keep the social groups coherent and successful and, and reproductively successful on the savannah. Um, and with that cognitive and emotional apparatus, we are thrown into a vast maelstrom, not of information, but of requirements, um, interpersonal requirements, um, of many anonymous strangers who put demands upon us, um, of uh, expectations of prestige from people we don't know, people we partly know, expectations of uh, achievement and so forth, in a, a social setting which is infinitely more complicated than the one for which we were selected. And I think that many of the so-called mental disorders that arise, some of which, of course, are quite clearly genetically determined, things like schizophrenia and the bipolar disorders, but the vast mass of things for which people seek um, psychotherapeutic help I'm sure are determined by some sort of strain introduced into a mind which was undoubtedly selected for very small and relatively simple communities. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, that's 
true. It's, I mean, the, the number 12 is a famous one. I mean, there are 12 people on a various, or nearly 12, 11, 12 or 15 people on various kinds of team games. Um, uh, you can't imagine a game of football with a thousand people on either side. And you know, Jesus didn't have two disciples <laughs> um, so, and 12 people on a jury. So there may be some kind of statement there about the size of the group we evolved towards. But we happen to live, all of us, I think, in large cities. I mean, there are eight million people in London, and I don't find myself too crowded, even, even on the tube. So I think, really, it's rather limited what you can say in this, using this evolutionary language. Does evolutionary theory tell us anything about individual human behavior, I think, Stephen Pinker? Well, to the extent that each one of us is recognizably human and not a bonobo, not a gorilla, not a robot, an artificial intelligence program, yes. To the extent that we differ from one another, uh, it's less clear. Natural selection is a force that uh, homogenizes. It's, if there's a selection pressure, then it's, what it will tend to do is reduce variability in a given population. The variability that remains has a, a number of possible causes, but one of them is just random genetic variation that uh, doesn't have any adaptive value in it itself. So if you're interested in the difference between John and Bill or Mary and Sally, it's quite possible that evolutionary theory doesn't have anything to say. There's some ways in which it might, but it may not also. I mean, does evolutionary theory have anything to say about altruism or tenderness or morality? Sure, but at a, at a group level, uh, a population level, rather than an individual level, not uh, why is John or Mary an altruist, but why are people sometimes altruistic? You can ask it at that level. And you think there's an evolutionary answer to that? Um, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, everyone always says humans are the only species that are altruistic, but I, I, if you look at the cases of altruism, they're incredibly rare. The man jumping into the river to save people after a plane crash, that's why they're in the news, because they're incredibly rare. Um, and usually when people are altruistic, at some level, they're receiving something back, so it's not true altruism, even if it's the emotional satisfaction of helping someone out. And evolutionary theory and natural selection has nothing to tell us about morality, you think? I think it probably does. Uh, Franz Duval has written at, at great length about the biological basis of morality, suggesting mm. again that chimpanzees, other primates, other social animals have the same systems that we do in terms of justice and empathy, and that there may be a biological basis for right and wrong, knowing right and wrong, and punishment for wrong, and rewarding right behavior in a social situation. I get, I get very worried about the use of words like morality in a biological context. I mean, the thing is about morality is how do you measure it? How do you measure the morality of a fruit fly or a snail or a chimp? It's not easy. It's a human it's a human. But do we have construct. to measure the morality of a fruit yes, fly? Yes, if you're going to use biological arguments, you have to measure how much there is here, how much there is there, and what circumstances it's found. Um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge used to go to lectures on chemistry in the Royal Institution, and uh, when he was asked uh, why he put himself through this torment, he said, to improve my stock of metaphors. <laughs> and there's a real danger of just using this metaphorical language to explain animal behavior, human behavior in animal terms. It's just silly, it doesn't make sense. But, I no, but say there must be some sort of tendency. Hmm. Um, I mean, it would, be, it would be very odd if there weren't some sort of antecedents. I mean, the fact is that we seek antecedents for the structure of our hearts, we seek antecedents for the structure of our nasal septum and for the fact that we have a skull of the same, the, the full thought that we did. It would be very odd if there were not behavioral antecedents for the things that we approve in ourselves, such as morality. We, did, we don't have to therefore call it morality when we yeah. see it in chimpanzees. What we see are tendencies to form alliances, tendency to scratch backs in return for having one's back scratched, which is elevated into something which has elaborate moral discourse attached to it. It would be very odd if there weren't some sort of antecedent. Just being social sort. animals, any social animal means there's going to be competition no matter what, and there have to be ways to reconcile that competition to stay social, to stay in a group. Yes. I mean, our interest and the child's interest in its mother's face is part and parcel of something which actually um, can be seen to be part of the cement of social life. Mm -hmm. It's something which it inherits from its primate ancestors. How could it be otherwise? We are the creatures of our ancestry. We have descended with modification, and therefore there must be things to have been modified. It would be absolutely fatuous to deny that. Stephen Pinker. Well, I think there is a sensible uh, biological analysis of the moral sense, which is different from a biological analysis of morality itself. But the, uh, it can be measured. Uh, the technical definition of altruism in biology is uh, conferring a benefit uh, at, a that, at a cost to oneself. There is a prediction that altruism among non-relatives should generally evolve only when it's 
uh, accompanied by certain uh, psychological apparatus, such as the ability to recognize individuals, the ability to uh, hold grudges, the ability to mete out punishments or rewards commensurate with how you've been treated in the past. And in species that have uh, altruism in this technical sense. Indeed, you find memory for individuals, you find memory for their deeds, and you find behavior that looks as if it's holding a grudge.